Welcome to another scheduling class and today we're going to talk about an introduction to resource management. How to manage resources in a project, first of all what's the definition of a resource and then how are we going to manage these resources successfully. So the contents are going to be introduction to what resources are and then how are we going to allocate these resources to different project activities then how are we going to graphically represent these resources and resource distribution through what's called a resource use or resource loading histogram and then the cumulative curve which is a compilation of that histogram and finally how are we going to level these resources in case the use of these resources or the need for the resources exceed that resource availability. So first of all, the definition of what a resource is. For something to qualify as a resource for a construction project, it needs to meet three criteria. The first one, it has to be needed for the project, so if it's not needed, it's not a resource. Second, it can be managed, so if you cannot manage it, it is not a resource. Sunshine, for example, we cannot manage that, so it would not be considered as a resource. And the third one is it has to cost money to acquire to be considered a resource. Again, air that we breathe, we need it definitely to live rather than to work, but since it's free, it cannot be considered a resource. On the other hand, compressed air, which is going to be manufactured, compressed through a compressor, in this case it can be managed and we pay money to acquire it through the cost of the compressor, in this case it's going to be considered a resource. Examples of construction resources include the four M's. That's an easy way to remember them. Manpower, which is labor. Machinery, which is equipment. Materials. And finally, the most universal uh, resource, which is money, since it can be translated in any of the other three resources. Hiring labor is going to cost money. Purchasing or renting or leasing machinery or equipment is going to cost money. And buying the materials is, is going to cost money as well. So the first three types of resources can be translated into a monetary quantity, a part of financial resources. Resources also can be classified under one of two uh, different classifications, either stackable or non-stackable resources. Stackable, also known as stockable, which are resources that can be acquired in bulk and stored or stacked for a later time to be used whenever needed. Examples include some materials like wood, for example, pipes, uh, electrical supplies, things like, like that. Own capital, if you have your own capital, your own money that you're going to be working with, it can be stocked or stored in a bank. Owned equipment, which can be stored in a warehouse. And some other types of, some types of information like records, for example, if you have something on record, in this case it's considered as a stackable or stockable resource. The other type, which is the non-stackable or non-stockable, are resources that have to be used as soon as they are available. Otherwise, they cannot be used later, which is basically use it or lose it. Examples include labor productivity. If you have a crew of labor today, and you don't use the productivity of this crew of labor, then that day is lost. Borrowed money. Again, if the money is borrowed and you do not utilize it, then it, it doesn't have any value. Uh, rented or leased equipment. If you rent the equipment or lease it and you do not utilize it while you're renting it, then again its production rate is lost. Some materials like ready-mixed concrete. Ready-mixed concrete cannot be in its final shape cannot be stored or stacked for a while except for maybe 45 minutes to an hour or so but no longer than that so whenever it's available you have to use it immediately and some types of information that has volatility or it has to be acted upon immediately so that it would be useful or valuable like stock market for example stock market information this is this varies by the minute so if you act late, that's, uh, that's going to cause a problem. The third thing that we need to know also about resources is their availability limit. In how many units is that resource going to be available and for how long? So under the availability limits, we have two different types. 
we have something called a normal limit which is under normal conditions and without reaching extreme measures this amount of units of the resources are going to be available for immediate use so it's available at any time without having any problems the other type the second level or limit of availability is going to be called the maximum limit which is under extreme measures if push comes to shove if I have to do it right now this is the maximum amount of resources that have that can be made available it's usually greater than or equal to the normal limit peaks are going to be any amount any demand of that resource exceeding the maximum availability limit so if I need for example three bulldozers a day and I only need two then I have a peak of one extra bulldozer it results in the project being delayed if on a critical activity because again the only way to do a job that requires three bulldozers with only two is to extend the duration of the activity if it's a critical activity then the whole duration of the project has been extended this is a graphical representation of what we're talking about here so we can see for example this is the this green line represents the normal limit and this red line represents the maximum limit this is the aggregation of resources so today I'm gonna need three units of that resource if this is three for example and here we're gonna need four here we're gonna need five here we're gonna need if the maximum level is seven for example here we're gonna need eight here we're gonna need four again here we're gonna need nine so that resource demand varies depending on the activity being done on that particular day so on the horizontal axis we have the time on the vertical axis we have the resource units or their translation into the universal resource which is money or cost so obviously here we have a problem with these two peaks the project as such if these two peaks occur on critical activities this is infeasible even if it's on non-critical activities it's still in un infeasible or non-feasible unless and until we get rid of these peaks we notice also that we have troughs which is areas where I can afford having this resource but I don't need it so if you have played Tetris before for example you know that the secrets to the secret to uh, lasting in Tetris is to manage the shapes and try to fill the troughs with the peaks and this is exactly what we're going to try to do we're going to try to see if we can take that peak and fill in that gap or that trough so by redistributing the resources this is what we're going to call later resource leveling some examples of resources include salaried labor like the project manager, superintendent, project engineer, secretary, lab technician, security guard and others if you notice all of these do not perform any physical work on the project their job is primarily supervisory or administrative but they do not do any physical work like they do not lay concrete for example or uh, install tiles or vinyl or carpet or paint walls they do not do that they are tied to a project but not tied to one particular activity or work package and they get paid a fixed salary therefore mostly indirect cost the salary of the project manager is independent of how many cubic yards of concrete have we placed today on the other hand we have the hourly workers or the daily workers or the uh, the workers who are, whose uh, payment depends on their performance or the amount of work that they have done so they are hired to perform a specific task or activity like carpenters, masons, iron workers, electricians, foremen, etc. And they are paid for actual hours work. Therefore, it's mostly a direct cost. As later, we're going to talk about direct and indirect costs in another lecture. Their production rate is a conversion factor between achieved quantity and the number of hours worked. So the production rate is the quotient of amount of work divided by number of hours worked if you notice that uh, P is equal to Q over T remember the equation that we used to you before T or duration or time is equal to Q over P 
quantity divided by production rate. Here, if I want to know the production rate, I can uh, divide the quantity by the number of hours worked, and that would give us units per unit of time, like cubic yards per hour or uh, tons per day, and things like that. For the equipment, equipment that assists, we have different types of equipment as well. Equipment at, that assists in the construction process, not permanently installed in the project, it's just used to achieve work activities, like a tower crane, like a loader, like an excavator, uh, power generator, forklift, temporary power generator, just for construction. It's similar to direct labor. Its cost is derived from the completed quantity of work related to the number of hours that it has worked and the hourly rate. Inexpensive personal tools are usually treated differently, either as a lump sum for all tools or as the laborer's personal property. So it's going to be part of the labor cost. Trowels, for example, or uh, hand tools that are going to be uh, used by labor. Hammers. On the other hand, we have the installed equipment which stays permanently in the project after completion, thus becoming part of the direct cost priced in the bid. Uh, in examples include heat pumps, generators that are going to be permanent in the project for power generation on the project while it's operating, air conditioning units, and so on and so forth. Elevators. Materials, construction materials for use for construction but not being part of the final project deliverable, still treated as direct cost and part of the pricing of the relevant bid items. In examples include formwork, scaffolding, shoring, etc. It's not going to be part of the permanent work but it's needed to achieve that permanent work. The other, on the other hand, we also have the installed material, which is part of the final deliverable mm -hmm. and therefore a direct cost. Examples include concrete, rebar, concrete masonry units, bricks, blocks, insulation, tiles, paint, etc. All of these are materials that are going to be part of the final uh, completion of the project. Money is the financial resource used in construction, and there are two methods are available for assigning budgets to activities, either assigning a lump sum amount for each activity without specifying how the number is sliced or which resources are used. So for example, we say, this activity is going to cost £5,000. $5, These $5,000 can be the cost of the material, how many cubic yards of concrete, the, cur the cost of the crew of labor that worked to place this concrete, the cost of the equipment that was used. So I converted all of these different units into money and I added it up and that was the cost of the activity. Or assigning a number of units of certain resources to each activity together with a unit price for each of these resources. So I can say this activity is going to require one bulldozer, one foreman, one equipment operator, two laborers, etc. And then knowing what is the hourly rate and for how long am I going to need these resources, I can translate that into money. So uh, resource allocation is basically assigning different resources to different activities and assigning their costs to that activity as well. So the construction planning process includes the assignment of different resources to activities, also known as this process is called resource allocation. In the project monitoring and controlling process, the consumption of resources should be tracked and compared to the plan. I have estimated that this activity is going to need 200 cubic yards of concrete. While placing the concrete, I have ordered the concrete from a ready mix supplier. I've been tracking the shipments arriving on site, and I've been tracking the placement of that concrete, and I found that the, at the end that I needed 210 cubic yards. So maybe there was a loss or a waste of 10 cubic yards, or maybe the original quantity that was estimated was uh, less than what I'm going to need for the project. <coughs> Resource planning, monitoring, and controlling can help project managers understand resource demand versus resource supply for major pieces of equipment, trained workers, and, and so on and so forth. So, for example, we may say, today I'm going to need 500 man-hours of carpenters. So, this 500 man-hours can be achieved by 500 carpenters, each one working for one hour, or 
50 carpenters, each one working for 10 hours or any combination there in between. So we have to understand the project status and the cost the, to, uh, to control the project cost and schedule that's going to result uh, to be the result of using these resources. So the process for resource allocation, we have to identify all the resources that need to be assigned and tracked for the project, identify the quantities of these resources and their production rates and unit prices, assign critical resources to each applicable activity. So we're going to start with the critical activities because they are more critical, they're, they're, therefore they need to be uh, supplied and satisfied with the resource uh, supply before any other activity. Develop a histogram or table of resource consumption over time. Monitor the availability limits to ensure not exceeding the maximum available limit. So I'm going to draw horizontally the normal limit and the maximum limit to make sure that I, I do not exceed the maximum limit. And develop a contingency plan in case of exceeding the availability limits. In case I have a few peaks, what am I going to do with these peaks? How, how can I reassign them to other areas? where I have resource demand less than the resource availability therefore I can flatten that peak and have a smooth resource distribution. Looking at an example here we have a few activities so on this side we have the activities and then we have their predecessors the crew size, labor, how many labor am I gonna need the daily output of that crew and then the planned quantity that has been measured from the drawings and the specs and then the next step would be to assign how many days for how long am I going to need these resources again remember Q over P so this is Q and this is the production rate or output P so by dividing Q over P I'm going to get number of days and here in this case if we deal with full days not increments of days I'll have to round up so for example, here we have 280 linear feet and I can produce 100 linear feet per day. So 280 divided by 100 gives 2.8 which is going to be rounded to 3. Therefore it becomes, here I'm going to need 3 days, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, etc. That's based on the resource availability, based on the resource, the resource production rate and based on the total quantity for that activity. So the next step is going to draw a timeline, a draw a histogram. On the horizontal line I have time, on the vertical line I have the resources and then I'm going to plot these resources, how many units am I going to need uh, per day and so on. Based on these crew sizes, in this case labor is the resource to be uh, planned for. Now when we are allocating these resources the old school said, do not be constrained by the resource availability. Assume an unlimited resource availability and build your schedule accordingly and then look at the resource availability and adjust it accordingly. And then later on, it was found that this is a f very futile process because we'll have to do everything twice. I made an assumption and this assumption is not correct in the first place because I was assuming unlimited resources, there's always going to be a limit on some of the resources. Very rarely is there going to be an unlimited supply of resources. So according to that first assumption, you assume that sufficient resources are available to carry out the project which must be completed by a specified due date. So the only constraint is on the completion of the project. And then the second iteration in that process was we said we're going to combine these two steps assuming unlimited resources and then adjusting later on into one step. So we're going to start with the assumption that we have. We recognize that we have a limited resource availability and we're going to play, plan accordingly by again including these two horizontal lines, the normal limit and the maximum limit and taking that into consideration while we are developing our resource loading histogram. So there are definite limitations on the resources available to carry out the project and the objective is to meet the project due dates insofar as possible, which is minimizing the duration of the project being scheduled subject to stated constraints on available resources. 
which means I'm going to try to finish the project in the least possible time within the available limitations on my uh, resources. Long range resource planning management seeks to determine the combination of resource levels and project due dates that will minimize resource costs, overhead costs and losses which result when project due dates are not met. So now we are going through an optimization problem, not only meeting the deadline within the number of resources available, but what would be the best possible use of these resources so that I can minimize the total cost of the project and finish it still within the available time. So in resource allocation problems, the basic approach to be followed in solving each of these problems is to first order the activities according to some criterion and then to schedule the activities in order listed as soon as their pre predecessors are completed and adequate resources are available. Basically what we're talking about here, the, the uh, criterion, the main criterion to sort the activities is going to be their criticality, whether the activity is critical or not. So we're going to solve the, the network, draw a bar chart or solve the network and identify which activities are critical, which activities are non-critical and pay our first attention to the critical activities so they're going to be our first recipients of the resources. Here, for example, we have limited resource availability and we need to allocate these to the, this project. So here we have two activities starting the project. This is the project start. Two activities starting the project. And then we can basically, based on this table here, we drew the network. We can then solve the network to get the, the different dates, early start, early finish, late start, late finish, and so on and so forth determine which activities are critical, which activities are non-critical, and then start allocating the labor or the, the resource demands for these different activities and drawing our resource loading histogram and seeing whether we're going to be able to meet uh, that maximum limit, to be below that maximum limit of six labors or not. First of all, we can notice here that activities A and B, since th they occur at the same time, Activity A requires two labors, activity B four labors, so basically we're going to need six labors for at least the first, for, for at least uh, the first five days of the project. And then once activity A is complete, there's going to be a need for two more for uh, activity B. But once activity A is complete, activity C is going to step in and so is activity D is going to wait until B is complete. So again, we can draw the Gantt chart and assign resources accordingly. We're going to see an example of that. So here's the network. We have solved it. And then we are going to schedule the resources by the early start. First of all, we have to satisfy the critical activities. And then activity A, we're going to notice that it has two days of float. Activity C has four days of float. So we can maneuver with these activities in order to try to avoid that peak as much as possible. Based on this resource distribution, on the first day, I'm going to need six, 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 seven, seven, and so on. You can see the resource demand. Now, this 7 here resulted from resulted from uh, 4 on B and 3 on C. 4 on B and 3 on C. What if I moved activity C along its total float to avoid that excess? Moved it by 2 days. So I delayed it by 2 days of its total float. So instead of starting on day 6, we're going to start it on day... Uh, let's say 9 or day even day 8 if I start on day 8 that's going to be uh, okay so in this case the demand for days 6 and 7 is going to be only 5 which are from activity B and then here we're going to have 3 from activity D and the 2 from activity uh, C or whatever it was for activity C 
3 from activity C, so 3 from D and 3 from C, therefore it's still going to be within my maximum limit, so I now have solved that peak that resulted from B and C being at the same time. So here, when I moved activity C a little bit, now I still have float on activity C, and now as you can see, the resource peaks have disappeared, and my resource ut utilization is within the maximum limit, which is 6, and the project duration did not change. Here it was 14, and here it was 14. So I finished the project on time. I have satisfied the different objectives that I had. Now, if I want to do that for multiple resources, here I assumed only one resource, which is the labor. But if I have multiple resources to be done, labor, equipment, materials, subcontractors, etc., it's not going to be that easy. It's going to be a little bit more complicated. So we'll have to start now thinking about different strategies to reducing these peaks. First of all, can the activity be delayed beyond this early start without delaying the whole project? As we did with activity C, we moved it along its total float. If we can do that and that solves the problem, great. If not, can this activity be split into smaller chunks? So I can split it into two, two parts, start one a little bit earlier, start one a little bit later. If I can do that to avoid the peak, then again, that would be great. Can the activity be started and then paused for a while to avoid the peak and then resumed later on? Again, if I can do that, that would be great. If none of the above solutions work for the non-critical activities, then I'm going to start thinking about the same solutions for the critical activities, knowing in advance that this is going to delay the project or increase the duration of the project. Here's a flow chart that shows basically what we're talking about here. So calculate initial early start and late start for each activity. Determine the initial eligible activity uh, set, those activities with all predecessor activities scheduled, and so on. You can read basically on that. That's just a, an algorithm to show you how to solve the resource allocation problem. And as I said, if you have two or more resources to be allocated and leveled or planned for and smooth at the same time, most likely the software is going to do that for you because it's going to involve so many different permutations, so many different probabilities. So the easiest way to do, to do that is through the software following that algorithm that we're looking at. So basically this is a brief introduction about resource uh, allocation. We are going to solve a numerical example. I'm going to post that on Blackboard so we can see how to address this problem and how to solve uh, for different probabilities. I'll see you in another class.